Okay, bell ringer for today. Just a reminder, just told the class, Wednesday, next week, the 19th, we will have a quiz on presentation. We are just finishing up here soon. So Wednesday of next week, 519. Describe how the Cuban Missile Crisis was considered one of the most intense moments of the Cold War. There we go. I'll give you some time to work on that, and we'll move on. Getting worried. I thought you fell Me in. <laughs> Jeez. Give me another minute to finish up, and we'll move on. Okay, so what do we have here? What do we have? Describe how the Cuban Missile Crisis was considered one of the most intense moments of the Cold War. What do you got for this one, Kale? What do you have? The Cuban Missile Crisis was the most intense moment because in 13 days, they came closest to nuclear war. All right, good job, good job. 
So beginning in the 1960s, right around the start of JFK's presidency, he was dealt with a hard decision to make, right? Uh, he would, he, we, we kind of went through that yesterday with what you would do if you were JFK. And uh, we know the Cuban Missile Crisis was one of the closest encounters to nuclear war. Okay. And uh, what happened here? What happened? So obviously Cuba, who are they good buddies with? Who is helping them out with? Yeah, Soviet Union, good job with all these different types of supplies and armaments and ICBM missiles, medium range missiles, and they're loading them up on Cuba. Why would the Soviet Union do that? So first off, we see communism in the Western Hemisphere. That's a problem. Okay, that's not helping our goals out of containment whatsoever. But why would the Soviet Union load it up with missiles, ICBMs, Jakari? All right, good job. So by the mid 1950s, moving up into the late 1950s, the United States had these ICBMs in Turkey, in Italy, and the parts of Western Europe, and we really had. Nuclear weapons pointed at Moscow and many of these large cities in the Soviet Union for some time now. And the Soviet Union wanted to level the playing field, right? Yeah. Cody, do you have something to add? I was just going to say because it's also right next to us. Yeah, yeah, it's right next to us, 90 miles away from the border. Good, good. So uh, for the rest of the world, I mean, this <laughs> could have been nuclear warfare, obviously, but this was almost like a sign of weakness towards the United States. How could communism be coming? You know, how, how could it become so close to the U.S. in the Western Hemisphere? Uh, we were supposed to control that Western Hemisphere, that Monroe Doctrine, right? Prevent any communism from spreading in Europe, in Asia, but in the Western Hemisphere. Come on. All right, good. So what did JFK do? How did he try to mitigate this situation? How did he try to calm things down? Jakari? Uh, who's going to send the man to the moon? Okay, all right, so we're going to talk about that a little bit more today and tomorrow. But what else? What else did he do? Okay, good. So negotiations, right? So this is the first time really we see these two powers, these superpowers coming together to talk things down, especially with nuclear warfare just about to happen, just about to occur. Both powers knew that if this would happen, both of them would be destroyed. And what is that called? No, no, no. Mad, there you go. Mutually de assured destruction. Good. Mad. Awesome. Good, good, good. And then we know Fidel Castro is the one who's leading this communist charge in Cuba. So JFK, he forms a blockade around Cuba, and uh, he was trying to cut off any types of resources, armaments, supplies coming to Cuba. Khrushchev didn't like this too much, but once they kind of talked it out, discussed what they could do, they removed these nuclear missiles from Turkey, from Italy, Western Europe, right? The United States had to remove those. And the Soviet Union had to remove their missiles from Cuba. And what else could the United States not do? What did Khrushchev make sure uh, the United States couldn't do or prevent them from doing, I guess, to try to have some sort of safety? for their communist power in Western Hemisphere. What did Khrushchev say? The United States, you guys can do what to Cuba? Jakari? Invade them, right? Take them over, right? Yeah, they can't do that. They can't do that. All right, so they were trying to protect Cuba in the Western Hemisphere. Make sure that there's a communist power in the Western Hemisphere. And that might lead to a domino effect all across the world, maybe in the Central, uh, Central America, maybe in the South America, maybe in more parts of Asia. Okay, good, good. Is there any questions on that, guys? So again, that's really the closest I can think of that we got to nuclear warfare with another power, the Soviet Union, okay, during the Cold War. And uh, it was real close. It's real close. So we'll talk today about how the United States is trying to prepare for nuclear war. You know, what these citizens should do. And uh, we're going to move on today with the Berlin Wall. All right. Is there any questions on that? You guys good? Cool. Terms for today. Oh, there you go. Actually, let me get that one. We don't want that on there. We got Fallout Shelters and the Berlin Wall. <clears throat> 
So I'll post a video up for you. It's called Duck and Cover. It's just a cartoon describing to many Americans, children, what to do if there is ever a <coughs> nuclear attack on America. For the most part, probably wouldn't do too much. It was just more optimistic guidelines and safety, I guess. But you got to try to do something. All right, so fallout shelters and the Berlin Wall. Have you ever watched the, uh, the Wolverine movie? Where he's, in, where he's in Japan? Yeah. And then that, that nuclear missile comes down? Yeah. I was thinking about that, actually. The, you know what I'm talking about? So you, that was the Cuban Missile Coast. Crisis. Yeah. Yep. What is it? X Men. First class. Was it first class? Yeah. yeah. Yep. I just watched that not too long ago. Yeah. That's a good movie. Yeah. My favorite was probably. I don't remember. I mean, I like I like the how they threw all the, the, all the history into the X Men. Yeah, I thought that was pretty kind of cool. Yeah, Magneto's origins were pretty cool with Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. You know, I like the Days of Future That's a good one too. It's a good one too. Magneto's so cool. I think. Yeah. yeah. How many have you seen the Deadpool movie? Yeah. Those are pretty good. I like those. I like them. They made them more like a comedy movie. Yeah. Yeah. Rated R comedy, huh? You see the... What was it? From like the Marvel and Austin trailers. What's that? The Marvel and Austin trailers. Like the yeah. And all that. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. <clears throat> a lot of Game of Thrones. Yeah, in the... Yeah, actually, I didn't watch that trailer. I have to watch that one. Dude. The Venom Two trailer came out. Oh, that was yeah, cool. I'll watch that. I'll watch that Miles. Oh, pretty cool, huh? All right, what do we have here? Fallout shelters. What are fallout shelters, Angel? What do you have for fallout shelters? All right. Good job. Good job. So the United States government tried to push many of Americans to build these fallout shelters and prepare for nuclear war. Obviously, they couldn't supply these for the people all in everybody's yard or everybody's basement. So it was up for the citizens to try to prepare themselves. So whether it was in their basement, whether it was really a dugout into their backyard or underground shelter. Uh, these uh, citizens were all trying to prepare for this nuclear war that potentially could happen. And there's actually one well, closer to where I li lived at my dad's house. And fear not, it's pretty cool. It's just like this door into the ground. It's like, oh, what's that? It's a fallout shelter. It's like, oh, wow, that's pretty neat. So, uh, yeah. And this was preparation for the worst, for nuclear war. And uh, they'd have all these canned goods, canned items in there to prepare for nuclear war. And the radiation that could follow. So they're prepared to live in these shelters for a long extended period of time until it was safe to come back out. And uh, for many people that lived in cities or, you know, let's say in urban areas, they would get together at maybe a, like a factory, an under, underground basement of a factory or a school or a larger building and uh, try to obviously prepare for the worst because obviously in rural settings they can maybe hide in these other areas in their backyard or in their basement. But people that live in apartments and larger areas and skyscrapers and larger buildings, they need the locations to uh, obviously be safe as well. All right, Berlin Wall, what do we have? Andrew, what do you have for the Berlin Wall? Berlin, Berlin Wall was a guarded concrete barrier that physically and ideologically divided Berlin from 1961 to 1980. The construction of the wall was commenced by the German Democratic Republic on August 13, 1961. Awesome. Good job. Good job. So the Berlin Wall was almost like Khrushchev's retaliation to the Cuban Missile Crisis, to the U-2 spy plane, uh, really the United States being uh, almost, 
almost kind of aggressive in a way, right? So Khrushchev wanted to try to separate Berlin and creating this wall was the way he was going to try to achieve that and, and stop the trade between the west side and the east side of Berlin and to prevent any people from accepting democratic values or ideologies. Okay, you want to try to protect East Berlin from the democratic west. And the best way he thought he could do that was just build a wall. Build that wall, right? Okay, I'll build a wall. Yeah. All right, so moving on here today. Fallout shelters, real quick, I want to talk about this. Just show you a picture or two of these fallout shelters. So people were advised in commercials, programs, propaganda, whatever. I mean, newspapers, magazines. I don't say really too much propaganda, but uh, try to prepare for the worst. So building these underground shelters to protect them from nuclear war. So literally capsules under the ground, uh, you know, underground facilities to prepare for the worst. In many cases, like I said, people in rural areas or suburban areas might dig this in their backyard and uh, try to prepare for nuclear war. So as you can see, they might have an air vent and just kind of a capsule to enter down in underground. Uh, maybe it's in their basement of their home, of their house, and they would stock up on different items and essentials to, like I said, prepare for the worst. Uh, literally, going to the bathroom in buckets, right? Uh, canned goods. And, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the fallout shelters in a nutshell. Okay, but they would actually put these in catalogs and brochures of how to actually build these fallout shelters and how to prepare for it and uh, what type of goods and items that people should have that are essential to live. Off. Obviously protecting against the blast, but radiation would follow suit. Uh, like I said, in larger cities and larger areas, they would have these signs located all throughout cities and towns, on schools, okay, on you know, larger industrial buildings. And uh, they would, many people would gather together here in these fallout shelters, most likely deep underground of these businesses or schools to try to prepare for nuclear war. Right. And there's a lot of different types of videos and uh, different types of directions and instructions of how to prepare for it if it would happen at school or if it would happen, in, let's say you're out walking around in the town, uh, it would be called duck and cover. So duck and cover, get close as you can to let's say a wall or you know, obviously something that was strong suited or fortified to protect yourself from the blast. So the first thing you would do is look for a bright flash in the sky, something brighter than the sun, brighter than anybody has ever seen. And then instantly run to something that was fortified and duck your head and cover. That's really all it was. In school, students would just duck underneath their desks and get in a fetal position in a way and cover their head to protect from a nuclear blast. You think that would protect anybody, really? Most likely not, no. Most likely not. But we had to send some sort of optimism to the people. It's like, hey, this will somewhat maybe help you. Most likely not, but uh, we got to prepare for the worst. All right, so those are fallout shelters, like I said, in a nutshell. I will attach a video. Check it out then on your own. It's called Duck and Cover. It's just a cartoon describing the children, describing the people of how they can protect themselves in a nuclear situation, a nuclear war. <clears throat> All right, real quick, the Berlin Wall. I'll talk about that. As things were getting heated up with the, with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, it, w it seemed that the Soviet Union and the United States really couldn't agree on too much other than avoiding a nuclear war. So in Germany especially, okay, Khrushchev thought it was vital to cut off trade and resources to eastern Germany from western Germany. At this time, western Germany, western Berlin, was really building up to becoming a democratic nation, a, a strong capitalist area. Right? There was a lot of business there. The uh, standard of living rose pretty high. Um, ever since the end of World War II, they've been rebuilding, and it looks pretty good. It looks pretty strong. And there's a lot of revenue, a lot of capital being created in Western Berlin, controlled by the United States, Great Britain, and France. And the same with Western Germany, obviously. 
Okay. We already talked about the Berlin crisis, how Stalin tried to cut off trade to Berlin. Because where is Berlin located? In Eastern Germany or in Western Germany? Chris? Eastern. Eastern controlled by who? Soviet. Yeah, Soviets. Good job. Good job. So Stalin tried to cut off all the transportation to Berlin. Well, we decided to send airplanes and drop off you know, different items to Western Berlin to support them in rebuilding after World War II and to uh, help establish stronger democratic, uh, obviously democratic values in Western Berlin. But after that becoming a failure, they did eventually open the roads and open the transportation to West Berlin. And uh, like I said, it was becoming a strong capital area, right? There's a lot of, a lot of economic growth, a lot of, a lot of business growth in Western Berlin. How do you think it was in Eastern Berlin and Eastern Germany? You think it was Strong? Do you think there's a lot of economic growth? Do you think their standard of living was pretty well? No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Okay, these people still lived in almost the shadows of World War II. Okay, there was still a lot of destruction from World War II, still in the 1960s, moving into 1960. So there's 15 years, right, after World War II where, you know, these people still were living in tough conditions, hard conditions. Okay, and they still saw the destruction of the war 15 years later. Okay, and the standard of living wasn't too well. Okay, it wasn't great at all. And now these people, a lot of people from East Berlin, were trying to escape to West Berlin. They're trying to really go across the, the border and to have a better, better life. Okay, this wall was created and literally split up families, split up friends from seeing each other. Okay. And the goal was to try to prevent East Berlin from accepting democratic values, all right? Uh, visualizing and seeing the production and the growth and the uh, prosperous times of West Berlin. So Khrushchev thought the best way to try to stop this democratic ideology, to try to stop these people in East Berlin from running across the border to West Berlin to have a better life was just create a wall, right? And like I mentioned, it separated many people, separated many families from seeing each other. Okay, some families, there's pictures of them waving each other across, you know, the wall by, uh, you know, like, like sitting in their apartments or sitting in these buildings so they could see each other. And it was pretty sad. And it was heavily guarded. If anybody would try to travel across, let's say, from East Berlin, the Soviet control, to the West Berlin, they were... Maybe their whole life. Okay. But here's kind of the creation of the Berlin Wall, right? How they're building it up. And it literally happened overnight. Literally happened overnight. Like I mentioned, families and friends were like, what's going on? And the Soviets were there guarding it, building this wall, and preventing anybody from moving over to West Berlin. It was a sad state of affairs. And let's say if there's someone that was just literally lived right across that border and worked over in West Berlin, there goes their job, there goes their livelihood, okay? And uh, that caused a lot of issues, obviously. But JFK would go and give a speech to Berlin, West Berlin, obviously, and he talked about how uh, this was a act against democracy, an act against freedom, God-given freedoms. And how Khrushchev and the Soviet Union were trying to literally take people's divine rights away from them. And how in democracy, in democratic countries, we don't need to build walls to try to prevent people from leaving. No one would want to leave these democratic nations, right? No one would want to leave these, uh, these, these places of freedom where their rights are preserved and held on to, to the greatest of value. And I think that hits pretty hard, right? This quote, freedom has many difficulties and democracy is not perfect, but we have never had to put up a wall to keep our people in. I think that really hits home, right? Okay. And how all these countries around the world that are accepting communism at that time, many of them had to build these borders, had to build these walls to prevent their people from leaving to democratic nations. Literally in North and South Korea, what was it? The 38th parallel, the DMZ. If anybody crossed that, they were shot and killed instantly. Now here we see it in Berlin, the capital of Germany. 
All right, with this speech, JFK, uh, he called himself, uh, what do you say? We are all Berliners. And some people say that he actually said, I am a jelly donut. Because a Berliner is a type of jelly donut. So they laugh about it. But in all reality, I'll show you the video. No one really perceived it like that at the speech because they're all jumping up and down and screaming and voicing their, obviously, their, their cheer for JFK. But people now kind of look back at it as like, he actually said, I'm a jelly donut rather than each Benai Berliner, which means we are all Berliners or I am a Berliner. Okay. So JFK does give a speech right around 61, 62, talking about, well, 62, talking about how this wall, even though it separates East and West Berlin, everybody's a Berliner, right? Everybody. And say how stupid it really was. And hoping that the East Berlin people would try to push this wall away and try to uh, form a more stronger democracy of the whole Berlin. Right? Try to unify it. Okay, so I'll show you this video now. Sixty-one Khrushchev creates the Berlin Wall. <laughs> 